Well, good morning. We're continuing our series, uh, Great Expectations, looking at, um, looking at the different aspects of the Messiah and looking at how Jesus' life reflects that he is the Messiah. And this morning, we're looking at the kingly Messiah, or how the Messiah was expected to fulfill the kingship of David. And the expectation would be that the Messiah would be a long-awaited king that would restore the kingdom of Israel, and rightful rule over the world. It's appropriate then, being Palm Sunday, the Sunday that we celebrate the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, where he was first declared king publicly by his followers, that we start there when we look at, his, at the kingship of Jesus, our Messiah. So if you want to turn with me, we're going to be in Matthew 21, 1 through 17 this morning. And I'll give you a moment to to turn there. Let's uh, read it together. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then uh, Jesus sent two uh, disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you. And immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on, the, on them their colt cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son, uh, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest And when he entered into Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, you have never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes have you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Now this passage sets up one of the most important confrontations that Jerusalem, its leaders, its religious elites uh, would have to deal with. And it is also the confrontation that gets set up that for every person, past, present, and future, will one day have to deal with. To understand why I say this is, uh, is a confrontation. We need to understand what happens on the road while Jesus and the disciples are going up to Jerusalem. You see, the gospel writers were very precise in what they recorded about Jesus and his life. Um, We know that from the book of John that there is so much that we don't have recorded uh, about the life of Jesus. But for whatever reason, the disciples uh, decided to include four verses before this that they felt were very important. So let's take a look at those four verses, a few verses before and ask, uh, and I want you to ask, why was this important to record? I'm sorry, it was five verses that we're looking at. Matthew 20, 29 through 34, it says, and they, and they went out to Jericho, a gr- uh, as they went out to Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting on the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked him, 
telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, in pity, touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. You see, this is important, not just because it is yet another miracle that Jesus performs. You might have read through that and be like, okay, this is just another miracle that Jesus performs uh, in a long list of miracles that he performs. He heals two more people who are blind. He's done that before, right? But this is important, not just because it is yet another miracle that Jesus performs, but because this is the first time that Jesus allows his claim to be the Messiah, to be the king, to be publicly announced, and him confirm it. Now, we've seen him be declared to be the Messiah before. If you read earlier, there's multiple times that he is declared to be the king, to be the long-awaited king. But each time he instructs people not to share that revelation. He instructs the demons not to share that revelation. When it is announced that he is the Messiah, that he is the long-awaited king, he tells them to keep it quiet, to not share that revelation. But here, for the first time, as he's going up to Jerusalem, these two men... On the eve of Jesus entering into uh, into Jerusalem for Passover, we see these two blind men calling him out as the son of David. And the son of David is one of the titles given to the Messiah. They are calling him the Messiah. It's very clear if you are in ancient, uh, if you're in ancient Israel, it would be very clear if you were to call somebody the son of David, you are calling them to be the Messiah, the long-awaited king. They were essentially standing up and saying, King Jesus, have mercy on us. And for the first time, instead of turning around and rebuking like the crowd did, because you've got to think, the, the disciples and the crowds that had followed him knew that he was the Messiah and the King, and they had seen him rebuke others or instruct others to keep this revelation quiet. For the first time, the crowds and the disciples see that when he is called the Son of David, the King, the Messiah... He turns around and says, yes, what can I do for you? You better believe that this would, be, would have been noticed by the disciples and those that were following him. They had been asking him over and over again, when is it time? When are you going to announce that you are the Messiah? When are you going to announce that you are the king? When are you going to make your move? To them, this would have been the Super Bowl. I bet they heard this and they were like, it's go time. It's go time. We're ready. He has finally publicly acknowledged that he is the king. And then what we see next is we see that Christ orchestrates his arrival into Jerusalem. In Matthew 21, 1 through 17, we see Christ having his hand and orchestrating every piece of his arrival into Jerusalem. He's instructing the disciples on what to do. He has publicly announced that he is the king. He has acknowledged it. And this is the, the sign, I think, that the disciples and his followers were waiting for. Christ was fully in control, and he was 100%. He was setting up this epic confrontation that had to happen as he entered into Jerusalem, and it would change all of history. This confrontation is, is, is simple. When he publicly announces and publicly acknowledges that he is the king and he is entering into Jerusalem that, and, and they are announcing Hosanna to the son of David, to the king, he is saying you have two choices because there's only two choices 
either crown him king or kill him. And that's the confrontation that we see this morning. Either lay everything down, serve him, crown him as king, or kill him. He rides into the city on a colt, fulfilling the messianic prophecy from Jeremiah 9.9 that we see referenced here in Matthew. But also his disciples are publicly announcing him to be the Lord, to be the Messiah, to be the son of David, to be the king, laying palm branches down in coats like you would for a victorious general or ruler, which garners the attention of the city. As you, as you see in, in, in the passage, the city, it stirs up the city, and they ask, who is this? And then, and then he goes into the temple and he cleanses it out. And when he cleanses it out, you'll notice he calls it my house. Again, declaring that the temple, that he is God, that he is king, that he is the Messiah, because only a lunatic, if he wasn't the Messiah, would walk into the temple and call it my house. And then he performed miracles in the temple. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the children were calling him the Messiah, he again publicly confirms it. They ask him, hey, are you going to do anything about this? They're calling you the Messiah, the son of David, the king. And he says, yeah, because I am. You're going to have to deal with it. There is a confrontation that he is setting up when he walks into Jerusalem, and that is whether we are going to crown him or kill him. And he leaves them no room in this confrontation. It was go time for Israel. They were either going to crown him or kill him. And the thing is that, that this confrontation that Jesus sets up over 2,000 years ago is the same confrontation that each of us, every person in this room, every person in Topeka, every person in Kansas, every person in the United States, every person on the world, every person online listening will one day have to make a decision on. The problem is that Jesus was not the Messiah, not the king they were expecting. And he's often not the Messiah, not the king, not the person, not the God that we are expecting or wanting. But that's a good thing because Jesus was the king that they needed. He is the king that we need. And because he is the king that we need, he is also the king that is victorious. It's hard to believe that not within a week, not within the week of Jesus entering into the city, declaring himself to be the long-awaited king, the son of David, the Messiah, many of those same people that praised his name would also be the ones calling for his death. And that's ultimately because he was not the king they were expecting. The expectation for, for the Jewish people, the expectation for the Messiah was that he was going to be a military leader, that he was going to be someone who would rally the troops, rally the nation to rise up and overthrow the Roman Empire, drive them out of Israel, remove the oppression that they had been experiencing. That was the, that was the expectation of the time. And that, that still honestly is the expectation of the Jewish people when they look at Jesus. That, was, that is the expectation that they had for him then. I remember seeing Ben Shapiro on the Joe Rogan show a couple of months ago, about six months ago. Joe Rogan was asking, if you don't know who Joe Rogan is, he's probably one of the most famous YouTubers and podcasters out there. Uh, but he had Ben Shapiro on, and he was, who's a Jew, and he was asking him about Jesus. 
And he, he makes a comment, and he says, well, uh, don't Jewish people think that he was a prophet? And Ben replies, and he goes, no, we don't think he was a prophet. And so Joe, he, he asks him, he says, well, what do you think about Jesus? And, and Ben re- replies, and he goes, historically, I think he was a Jew that tried to lead a revolt against the Romans and got killed for his troubles. So 2,000 years later, the expectation on Jesus is still that he was going to be a military leader, that he was going to rally the troops, that he was going to remove Rome from Israel. He was going to overthrow Rome. That was the expectation, a strong military leader that would come in and be king. But he was, Jesus was not the king they were expecting. Because, all right, think about this. When you're looking at the triumphant entry, if you're entering into the city, a great military leader that is going to overthrow, that is going, that is going to overthrow the occupiers, that is going to rally people to your cause, are you going to enter in to the city on a donkey? On a colt? No, you're going you're gonna to pick a war house, a war horse, a, a stallion that, that garners, that is, that is strong, that garners strength, that garners people to your cause, that says, hey, look, look at me. But instead, Jesus enters into the city as a servant, not a warrior. He, he enters into the, uh, on a donkey as a servant. Not, not, a, not a warrior on a steed. And the first thing he does is, is instead of confronting Rome, he goes in and he confronts the money changers in the temple. He cleanses his house. He calls out Israel, not Rome. He calls out Israel, not Rome. He goes in and he cleanses out his house. And then he departs. This was not what they were expecting. They were not expecting the king to arrive, confront Israel, call out Israel, and then leave. No, they were expecting him to come in, rally the troops, and expel Rome from Jerusalem. And so he creates this confrontation that is, exa- uh, that is exasperated by, by not meeting their expectation. He is declaring himself to be the Messiah, to be the king, but at the same time, in creating this confrontation, either crown me or kill me, and, and at the same time, he's not meeting their expectations. And the Jewish people... Because, they, because he is not meeting their expectations, turn against him. Even though he is declaring himself to be the king, and a few days later, or a few days earlier, we're praising him and saying he is our king. So Jesus creates this confrontation, make me king or kill me, but in a way that is incredibly humble, entering into the city on a donkey as a servant but also incredibly immodest because while he was humble in doing it, he was immodest in the fact that he was saying, I am king. There is no way around this. I am the king. I am the Messiah. This is the temple is my house. If you look at Christ, he is throughout the gospels. He is an incredibly Humble man, incredibly humble. But modesty is not something that would be applied to him. Because anytime he is confronted with his kingship, he doesn't hide it or put it away. He confirms it. He might tell other people to not share it. But there is no, I'm not the king, I'm not the Messiah. He confirms it. He is. 
There was an expectation that he would declare himself king, lead an uprising against Rome, and that they would be free from oppression. But he just cleaned out, he, he, you see, he just as he cleaned out the, the money changers in the temple for taking advantage of people in the temple, taking advantage of God, the Jewish people, just like, like them oftentimes, we, we don't understand why Jesus had come. They were wanting to use Jesus. The, the Jewish people were wanting to use Jesus, use the king for their own advantage. They had their expectation that they wanted Jesus to fulfill. And they were wanting to use God instead of God using them. And this is so often what we do in our life. The Jewish people, they they didn't want the Messiah to come and, and fulfill what he had come to fulfill. They wanted to use him to free themselves from the oppression of Rome. They wanted to use Jesus, use the king for their own advantage. They wanted to use God instead of letting God use them. And this is where the gospel is so important. And I love how Tim Keller, he's a pastor that recently passed away, author, Um, He pastored up in New York for many years. He puts it this way. Sin is servants putting putting themselves in the place of the king. Sin is servants putting themselves in the place of the king. Therefore, salvation was the king putting himself in the place of the servant. I'm going to say that again. Sin is the servant's putting themselves in the place of the king. Therefore, salvation was the king putting himself in the place of the servant. We often ask our, our, ourselves a question, what is so wrong with the world today? Think about it. What can cause a person to mutilate their body because they believe they are a different sex? Or what can motivate a person to shoot up a school full of children? Or on the complete ex- other extreme, what can... What, or the fact that you may have been worried sick over something this morning. What can cause you to be worried so, so much that you get sick over it this morning? I know those are, those are complete extremes, but they all boil down to one thing. One thing. And that's where the servant is putting themselves in the place of the king. The servant is putting themselves in the place of the king. Those who, who, choose to, who, who choose to find their identity and their sexuality, they are putting themselves in the place of the king. They are putting themselves, they're finding themselves in, in their identity outside of, of the king of the universe, outside of King Jesus. Just as this morning, if, if you're worried about something, you're putting, some, you're putting yourself in front of the king. You're putting yourself in the place of the king because you are thinking that you know better. You have an idea of what your life should look like, and you know better than King Jesus. And, and I, I'm going to have to confess to you this, this morning that, that this passage really spoke to me. This, this, this spoke to me because I struggled with it this week. As many of you know, our house has been on the market since, I think, October. We're trying to move up here. We want to be here. Our desire is to be here fully with y'all. It has been a struggle in a lot of different ways to commute from here in Texas for both me and my family. But we love y'all and we want to be here. And and that is a sacrifice that we are willing to make. But at times, it is a struggle for me to wrap my head around why the Lord has not sold our house yet so we can move. And I found myself this, this week basically arguing with God, saying, you called us to be here. It was clearly evident. Why in the world are you not selling our house? 
in my mind, it would be better for you to sell our house so we could move to Topeka and be here, be present. My idea of my life was that the, well, the house would have sold months ago and I would be here. And I was basically getting angry with God, worried of the stress that it was putting on my family, angry at him that he was not doing it according to my plan. I was putting myself in the place of the king. And that's idolatry. Anytime, anytime we put something in place of the king, anytime we put something, a desire, anytime we put ourselves or our ideas or our thoughts or our desires or our reasoning before God, before King Jesus, that is idolatry. And we are told to have no other gods before God. Idolatry is one of, it is, it is a, a base sin that we all struggle with. And this is what the Jewish people were dealing with as well. They were putting themselves in the place of the king, wanting to use Jesus for their own advantages in overthrowing Rome and, and not understanding why Jesus had come. We do this so often personally. We do this so often corporately in a church. As a, as a body of believers, we can, be, we can be guilty of idolatry, of putting things in front of God, in front of the mission of God. One of the things I asked in my interview with y'all was, are there any sacred cows in the church? Every church has them. So every church has them. I, I say sacred cows because reference to um, the Israel, <laughs> Israelites uh, making it an idol uh, to worship. And, and sure enough, I, I'm not going to tell you what the sacred cows are in Bethel. Maybe you know what they are, but luckily the leadership of the church does recognize that there are sacred cows here. Those are idols that this church needs to battle because we are putting something in front of the mission of God. We are putting something in front of the mission of God. A, a, a Bible-believing church should not have any idols, should not have any sacred cows, but because it's full of, of broken people, we have idols. We have sacred cows. But that does not mean that we should not confront them that does not mean that we should not confront them and tackle them and work to overcome them because ultimately we want to be a people that crowns Jesus and not kills him. We want to be a church that crowns Jesus and doesn't kill him. Just as the Jewish people knew how their king and their Messiah was supposed to go. They had their expectation. They, they wanted to be saved by the strength from the oppression of, of the Romans. They wanted to be saved by, by strength, but it, that is not what they needed, and Jesus knew that. He knew that their oppression was deeper than the oppression from the Romans. He knew that sin, sin's grip on the world was the cause of that oppression, as well as every other oppression in the world. He knew that the power of sin needed to be broken. The king knew better. The king knew what we needed. And even though we want to be saved by strength, by our own strength, if you look at every religion in the world, past, present, and future that, will be, that has been dreamed up and will be dreamed up outside of Christianity, it is all based on our strength and what we can do to earn salvation. It is all based on strength, the strength that we have. But Jesus knew that you could not be saved until you see that you must die. Romans 6.23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death, 
but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus knew that, that they needed to be saved. We needed, we needed to be saved from something far greater. And until, that, until we were saved from that, they could never be saved from anything else. We could never be saved from anything else. Until we were saved from sin, from our own idolatry, from our own putting God or putting our place in or putting ourselves in, in the king's place, until we were saved from that, we would never be saved from, from oppression. And so Jesus knew that we couldn't be saved until that we saw that we must die. And so that we are not saved by strength, but rather we are saved by grace, not by our moral efforts, but we are saved by his grace. The universal religion is that we are saved by strength. We are saved by the things that we do, our works, our moral standing. That is the universal religion. That we are saved by the things that we do. How good of a person I am. Does my good outweigh my bad? I remember seeing an interview by John MacArthur on CNN and he was being asked about this, and he, he, he said, absolutely not. This, this is not something I believe. I do not believe that, that we are saved by any merit of our own. And, and the, the, the CNN commentator, he said, well, what about justice and salvation? What about justice? I mean, and... and John MacArthur just stops him and he says, we don't want justice. We don't want justice because justice is death. Justice is death for every single one of us. Instead, we want grace, we want forgiveness, and we want mercy. And that's what Jesus knew, King Jesus knew that we needed. He knew that we needed grace and forgiveness and mercy. Because if we are saved through our strength, then it would be on us. And we're already at fault. We love to put ourselves in the place of the king. And so if we saved ourselves, if the Jewish people saved themselves, if they removed themselves from the oppression of the Romans, they would just go and oppress others because of their heart. In the same way, if we are saved by our own strength, we would go on to oppress others because we would begin to see ourselves as better than they are. That we have the answers. But instead, we are saved through our weakness. That, that's the message of Palm Sunday, is, is understanding that we are saved through our weakness. That King Jesus knew us, knew what we needed, knew that in our weakness, he would be strong. And this is the message that is echoed by Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and 10 when he says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with the weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And that strength is found in Jesus. We are saved through our weakness because we cannot accomplish our own salvation. 
And in doing so, in, in Jesus going to the cross, accomplishing the thing that we could not accomplish, he is victorious. He is victorious in the cause that he sets out to accomplish. He came out not just to save Israel from the power of sin, but save the world from the power of the sin. And so he goes to the cross, he enters in, he says, I am king, I am here to save you, crown me or kill me, and they choose to kill him. And through that act, he accomplishes his goal of saving the entire world. He is victorious, he defeats death, he defeats the power of sin. And we see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57, when it says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The victory is in the power that we have over sin through his death. Romans 6, 2 through 7 says, How can we who, who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried and therefore with him by baptism into death in order that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father that we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we no longer be enslaved to sin for one who has died has been set free from sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Christ's kingship, the declaration of that kingship that he makes upon the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, he pre presents us with a confrontation. We either crown him or we kill him. There is no middle ground. There is no middle ground. When he sets up this confrontation, when he enters into Jerusalem for the world, there is no middle ground. There are two chilling passages in scripture that speak to this. First in Revelation, John the Apostle, the first one I'm going to talk about is that in Revelation, John the Apostle describes a scene where Jesus is speaking about either being hot or cold, but to those that are lukewarm, he spews them out. There is no in-between. You either crown him or you kill him. There is no room in the middle. You can't just say that I kind of like Jesus or I like going to church because you want to look good or, or you like the morals that it teaches and, and you want your kids to pick up those morals, um, but you don't ever want to surrender your life. You don't ever want to surrender yourself to the king. You just want to be here. In fact, you might even participate a little bit. So it makes it look like you, you believe in Jesus, but you haven't really submitted your life to Jesus. You haven't surrendered fully. You haven't gotten down on your knees and said, Lord, I need you. I need you as a savior. I am, I, I am declaring you king in my life. If, if you're here today or you're listening online and that is you, Matthew 7 gives a special warning to people that are like that, where you are using God and not letting God use you. Matthew 7, he says, there's going to be people that come to him at the end and they say, Lord, Lord, look at all these things I did in your name. And he says, depart from me, I never knew you. King Jesus will not be used. He expects nothing less than an absolute surrender because he is the king. He is the king. And we must answer the question that was set up and put before us over 2,000 years ago when Jesus rode on a colt into Jerusalem, announcing to the world that the king 
have, has arrived. Let's pray.